Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start. So uh, please keep your microphones on mute, and uh, I'll just give a quick overview and opening remarks here. So uh, thank you for joining the Federal Communication Commission's Tribal Webinar to discuss an exciting new funding opportunity available to support tribal outreach through the Affordable Connectivity Outreach Grant Program. My name is Bambi Cross, and I'm the Chief of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy, and we're based in Washington, D.C. The Federal Communications Commission is an independent federal agency responsible for implementing and enforcing America's communications laws and regulations. Through rulemakings and enforcement activities, we regulate communication service providers. Our work covers everything from preventing unwanted calls to emergency alerts to ensuring that persons with disabilities have access to communication services and technologies. Just a little bit of a philosophical background on today's webinar is about digital equity. It's an important area of focus for the FCC and Chairwoman Rosenworcel. It's an agency-wide priority. Part of what that means in practice is that we are actively working to ensure that we are closing the broadband affordability gap through the Affordable Connectivity Program that we are establishing rules and model policies to prevent digital discrimination, and that we are establishing rules and model policies to, I'm sorry, that we have maps with granular level detail and that we have an inclusive and accessible consumer engagement process that allows us to promote policies that bridge digital disparities and extend our country's telecommunications resources to everyone and everywhere. Affordability is the number one most cited barrier to broadband adoption. And the good news about this moment is that we're not only, we not only have a program to provide financial assistance to, to low income households, but we also have an outreach grant program to ensure that we can empower trusted messengers to develop and implement innovative outreach strategies to expand the circle of digital opportunity to everyone with a reliable high-speed internet connection at home. Round two of the ACP Outreach Grant Program allocates $5 million through its Tribal Competitive Grant Program, specifically for outreach to tribal communities to raise awareness of the ACP program and its enhanced tribal benefit of $75 monthly to help households on tribal lands afford the cost of having reliable, high-quality internet service at home. ACP also provides a one-time discount of up to $100 for a laptop, tablet, or desktop computer. Today, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy is collaborating with our fellow division, and we're both housed in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. So together, we're offering this webinar on the Outreach Grant Program. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, please use the question and answer function to ask your questions. Uh, that will go for the entire webinar. And the Q&A function is your means to ask questions and seek clarifications. We'll be reading the questions prior to answering as much as possible. Your microphones are muted. and This webinar is being recorded and will be available at a later date on the events page. With that, with that I'd like to introduce Miriam Montgomery, Grants Management Policy Advisor for the ACP program, who will lead the presentation and question and answer segment of today's webinar. Miriam? Thank you, Bambi, for that introduction. And hello, everyone, and welcome to the um, ACP Affordable Connectivity Program Outreach Grant Program um, webinar. And specifically today, we're here to talk about the sub-program, which is the Tribal Competitive Outreach Program. Um, as Bambi mentioned, my name is Miriam Montgomery, and I lead the FCC's grants efforts and, um, and serve as the program officer for the Affordable Connectivity Outreach Grant Program. All right, um, so Bambi briefly covered, um, provided an overview of what the Affordable Connectivity Program is um, that this grant program was established to support. So with that, I'll just again quickly recap what the Affordable Connectivity Program is so that um, you all have a better kind of understanding of why this grant program was um, created to support outreach and enrollment efforts um, in support of the Affordable Connectivity Program. 
And I'm just going to say ACP from here on out just to um, as a short reference. All right, um, so the afford ACP is um, an FCC program that is administered by USAC um, with oversight from the commission. And it's also a program that was established as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, it's a benefit program that helps qualifying low-income households uh, that you know are unable to afford internet um, services that this provides subsidy to help support and um, offset the cost of internet. And um, just in terms of you know what are the benefits that um, the eligible households can leverage as part of the ACP, that is up to thirty dollars a month discount for broadband service and associated equipment rentals, up to seventy five dollars for households that live on tribal lands. And um, as BAB mentioned earlier, a one-time discount of $100 to go towards laptop, desktop, or tablet purchase. Um, this is just, you know, an overview of the ACP. There's more information um, that is available on getinternet.gov. But really, when it comes to why we're enlisting um, outreach partners to, to help again, raise awareness um, of the ACP uh, to qualifying and eligible households, really understanding, you know, what does ACP, what is ACP and what um, benefit does it provide to consumers is going to be foundation to that outreach efforts. So next, um, the, the focus of today's webinar is really going to be one of the sub-programs under the ACP Outreach Grant Program, and that is the Tribal Competitive Outreach Program. We're in government, so we love acronyms, and the um, acronym that we're going to use for the sub-program is going to be TCOP. Um, so as part of today's webinar, I'll provide an overview of what round two funding opportunity looks like for TCOP, in addition to uh, walking you all through the application and, and, um, and review process. If you are successful in submitting an application and being selected for a grant, you know, what are some of the obligations that you will have as a grant recipient so that when you are deciding whether or not to submit a grant application, you can make an informed decision about um, whether or not to do that. All right, so in terms of the purpose of the ACP um, outreach grant program, and, and this is the umbrella grant program um, that, that, was, that was established. And if you all have been following um, the commission closely and um, the ACP grant program, you know that we released um, round one funding back in November where we released a uh, notice of funding opportunity and there were four sub programs as part of that. So round two is really focused on TCOP and the National Competitive Outreach Program. So the two pilot programs that were in place as part of round one are no longer, um, we no longer have new funding opportunity for those. So in terms of the purpose of the ACP Outreach Grant Program, again, as I mentioned, it's one tool among a comprehensive set of measures that was authorized by Congress to, and implemented by the commission to, to help bridge the digital divide. And part of that is providing federal funding um, for FCC, providing federal funding for the FCC to eligible tribal governmental and non-governmental entities with the funding and resources um, that are needed to not only help raise awareness of the ACP, and, but also um, help eligible households that need assistance with the enrollment process to be able to um, enroll and, and ultimately um, be able to have a more affordable and um, sustainable connection. So with that, um, the grant program is administered by the Federal Communication Commission's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, or CGB, and it's a discretionary grant program. That means it's a competitive program, so applications have to, eligible entities may submit an application for funding consideration, and through a competitive review and funding determination process, we select um, our, our grant recipients from that. Um, if you are 
following, and I believe the link to our ACP grants website is available here under Q&A, um, and we'll again provide it as a resource later on on the slide. There are, um, you know, if you're interested in applying for this grant program, just make sure there's a screenshot of the cover page for the notice of funding opportunity that you're looking at. Um, the NOFO that says round two on the cover page and the opportunity number that ends with 004. That way you can make sure that um, you're referring to the right NOFO because the application submission process and requirements have changed, funding amount has changed, the performance period has changed from round one funding. Next, um, I'd like to cover the program goal and objectives. And um, again, as mentioned previously, really the goal of the program, the grant program at large and, and TCOP is as a subcomponent of the ACP outreach grant program um, is the same, which is to facilitate the promotion of the affordable connectivity program and increase awareness of and participation in ACP among eligible households. In support of the goal, we've established three objectives within the commission. Um, one is to expand and support diverse and impactful outreach efforts to strengthen our outreach partners um, by empowering them to mobilize people and organizations, again, to um, help raise awareness. And lastly, ultimately increase ACP enrollment as a result of grant funded activities. Um, these measures and or these objectives are critical. Um, and if you apply for a federal grant for the TCOP funding and you're selected for an award, um, there will be a quarterly performance reporting requirement, which I'll cover later on in the presentation. And um, part of that will be where we'll collect measurement data to be able to actually track and, and report against how we're moving the needle um, as a result of grant funding efforts. Um, Measures are not relevant unless they're measurable and, and tracked. So that's what we ultimately want to do. I do want to highlight that one key change from round one for those of you that may have um, read the round one NOFO or um, know about the round one funding opportunity is that for this second round, only tribal governmental and non-governmental entities are eligible to apply and ACP outreach and enrollment must be directed to eligible households on tribal lands. So the difference is under round one, any governmental and non-governmental entity is eligible to apply as long as funds are being directed to support outreach and enrollment efforts to households on tribal lands. Whereas when during round two, it has to be only tribal governmental and non-governmental entities that are eligible to apply. So I just wanted to highlight that key change here. Next, um, so in support of the three performance um, the program objectives that we've established, these are the measures that, um, that we have for awareness. How are we raising awareness of the ACP and how are we increasing enrollment efforts? So we've established a set of measures to, uh, to be able to track as part of the quarterly reporting so that we can actually um, gauge as a result of not only grant funded efforts um, at the individual grantee level, but at the aggregate program level, you know, how are we doing and, and really being able to increase awareness and um, increase enrollment as well. Um, what type of outreach activities are being implemented? You know, number of personnel um, that are that are actually conducting these outreach events. Um, how you know what type of outreach activities are more impactful than others in terms of increasing the awareness? Um, and you know, what type of in-person events are more impactful than others? And really, also, you know, how many net new eligible households are being enrolled that have never had internet in the before. So whether it's home or home internet or mobile internet or both. So um, these are the measures that you'll find in the NOFO. And these are the measures that if you are, um, if you apply and you're selected for funding, 
that we'll, um, we'll be able to track closely through quarterly reporting. All right, so TCOP program requirements. Um, so this is another change where for round one, these were program priorities. So um, for entities that submitted an application that applied, if they applied under round one funding as part of the November 2022 funding opportunity, if they commit to addressing these different components, um, they would receive a bonus point and increase the likelihood of them being selected for funding. Whereas for um, the second round, these are program requirements. And part of that is we have very limited amount of funding available for the second round. And we really want to make sure that um, those that are selected for funding um, that, that become grant recipients are truly executing um, impactful outreach activities. So just to kind of highlight examples of program requirements for TCOP round two, one is um, familiarity with the ACP and experience with or knowledge of bridging, bridging digital disparities and connectivity issues, um, targeting un, underserved low-income households or individuals that currently have no connection, no access to broadband service, um, targeting outreach in communities that have low ACP participation rates, um, and also targeting those that are hard to reach populations. And we have examples of that here. Um, it's not a comprehensive list. These are just examples. And again, um, that, you know, for, for the TCOP, it's um, persons who live in rural or tribal areas uh, and have been historically underserved or marginalized. Um, also experience with or past success in conducting out, you know, um, outreach regarding government programs and resources. Really, if you're thinking about um, applying what we want to see from an evaluation standpoint is, you know, are, are, the, are the organizations that are applying actually trusted messengers? They've, they have experience conducting outreach events um, or outreach activities in the past on various government programs. Can they replicate what they've done in the past, you know, on other um, government programs and resources to um, support ACP eligible households and promote this program? Are they trusted messengers in their communities? And, um, and also, do they have experience with or capability providing multilingual outreach? So these are just... Um, examples of program requirements and in the application, we do ask you to um, really kind of showcase and explain, right, your role and in, in being able to meet each of these um, program requirements. All right, um, so next is eligibility. Who is eligible to apply for round two funding? And um, again, Eligibility is limited to tribal governmental and non-governmental entities, and they must conduct ACP outreach and enrollment assistance to eligible households that live on qualifying tribal lands. So in terms of types of entities that are eligible, it's a wide spectrum. So tribal governments um, or subdivisions, tribal designated housing entities, tribal designated community-based organizations or that include social service organizations, tribal designated community anchor institutions. Um, think of like your public library, for example, um, tribal designated public service organizations. And one key kind of takeaway from the slide is that, um, you know, tribal nations do not have to have the federal um, recognition or they don't have to be federally recognized to be able to apply. Um, there are no exceptions to this eligibility requirement. And um, when we receive applications, we'll be conducting eligibility check before we even consider that application for funding consideration. So please just pay close attention to um, this eligibility requirement. Okay, next um, we have uh, a list of entities that are not eligible to apply. 
And um, again, this is consistent with the report and order, the second report and order that established the ACP outreach grant program. And it's consistent with round one funding opportunity as well as um, round two funding opportunity for TCOP and um, the list of uh, ineligible entities. One is broadband providers, their subsidiaries, affiliates, representatives, contractors, and agents. Um, couple of takeaways here. One is consumer choice is, um, is really, really critical and it's inherent when it comes to ACP, um, the Affordable Connectivity Program in general, and most certainly any type of outreach efforts that are conducted as part of that. And, um, and if broadband providers are applying for this grant program, that goes against um, the consumer choice. Not only that, but um, broadband providers are required through ACP rules to um, promote their low cost plan um, and that and, and to promote it and conduct outreach on that. So they're already required to do that. So certainly um, they will not be receiving federal grants to, to meet their obligation as it stands. And then lastly, the contractor component um, and the notice of funding opportunity or the NOFO does go into details describing what we mean by broadband providers, subsidiaries, affiliates, representatives. But on the contractor side, really what we're looking for there is you know, if, if organizations that are eligible are receiving, um, say, grants or donations from ISPs, that doesn't ex exclude those entities from being able to apply as long as they meet the eligibility requirement. What we're looking for here um, for the purpose of determining eligibility or ineligibility is um, that it can't be a binding agreement with an internet service provider or a broadband provider. Um, and, and there can't be kind of any influence from the broadband provider and how deliverables or work products are being um, produced and approved. Next, it's broadband industry groups and trade associations. Um, they're not eligible to apply. Anyone that is uh, debarred or suspended or excluded, um, right, from receiving federal financial assistance, that is not a ACP grant required or prohibition or an FCC prohibition. This is a federal government wide prohibition. So um, just wanted to raise that. Also, uh, 501c4 nonprofit organizations that engage in lobbying activities can apply. And lastly, anyone um, that is that has a debt or a lien against them by the federal government. And the next slide um, is, and this is really to ensure we're maximizing where limited um, ACP outreach grant funding, um, how it's being used. We're also, you know, if if an organization applied for round one funding and they were selected for funding, either as a grant recipient or sub-recipient. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's under the National Competitive Outreach Program or the Tribal Competitive Outreach Program for round one, or one of the two pilot programs, the Your Home, Your Internet Outreach Grants or the Navigator Pilot Program Outreach Grants. If anyone has received funding under round one funding opportunity for ACP Outreach Grants, uh, those entities are automatically ineligible to apply and be considered for funding. So um, if you're interested in applying and you know you've received funding or you have, you know, you're in the process of receiving your um, notice of award or accepting your notice of award um, from the FCC, either as a grant recipient or subrecipient, you'll be ineligible to um apply and be considered for funding. So I just want to reiterate that because we, we've we been getting a lot of questions on this very topic. All right, um, next it's funding information, everyone's favorite topic, and that is how much money is actually available for round two. And that is as part of the fifth report in order that made additional funding available for 
the National Competitive Outreach Program and the Tribal Competitive Outreach Program. Five up to five million dollars is available for round two, which means you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot of money. Um, and and we want to make sure that we're maximizing how we're allocating the five million dollars. So with that, what we've done is established um, updates to the performance period and the funding ceiling or the maximum amount of funding that an individual entity can apply for. So that's another change from round one. So for TCOB round two, 400,000 is the maximum amount that eligible entities may apply for. Um, we're, we're not going to issue grants north of that amount. So please pay close attention to this. And the period of performance is one year. Um, so round one funding was two years or 24 months for round two. The period of performance has been reduced to um, 12 months. So as it stands right now, we're looking to issue notices of um, award in the November timeframe, which will effectively start the performance period. So that means uh, period of performance will start sometime in the November 2023 timeframe and it will go through November of 2024. Um, one additional point on this slide, um, 400,000 is the maximum that entities may apply for. It doesn't mean you have to apply for that amount. So anything up to 400,000. Um, so, you know, Oftentimes, just similar to round one funding opportunity, there were some entities that re requested $50,000 in grant funding, some that requested $200,000. So really it's based on the nature of the outreach and enrollment um, activities that you intend to support for the one year period, as long as it's not in excess of 400,000. All right, um, so just key reminders here, um, and this is the submission requirement is not, hasn't changed much from first round. So the application deadline for TCOP is July 28th, 2023. Um, the deadline is 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So please pay close attention to that. I know there was some confusion during the first round where some, you know, especially in the West Coast and Pacific um, territories thought that the deadline was um, in their local time. It's an East Coast, um, Eastern Standard Time or Daylight Time, and it's 6 p.m. So any application that is submitted after 6 p.m. Um, Eastern Daylight Time on July 28, 2023 would be considered ineligible and will not be accepted for review. Also applying for federal grants, not just ACP outreach program or TCOP is a multi-step process. So in the NOFO, what we did was highlight um, the different you know, components, administrative requirements to get set up to be able to submit a grant application. And this is again, a federal government wide requirement. It's not unique to us. The only thing that is unique to us is the FCC registration number that we're now requiring as part of application submission for round one. This was something that was required post um, funding selection. And this information is going to be critical to being able to issue notices of award. So um, we're now requiring it pre um, as part of the application submission process. But just for these steps, um, Review the NOFO very closely. Make sure, you know, all of these take time, which is why we're saying, you know, at best, make sure you're starting this process at least four weeks before the submission deadline. So really, now, if you haven't begun establishing your EIN, your employee identification number, establishing your SAM.gov registration, which will then allow you to create a grants.gov account, um, you need to be doing that as soon as possible to be able to meet the submission deadline. 
All right. So going over funding restrictions um, and and we elaborate on what we mean by this and the notice of funding opportunity, but just some key takeaways here. One is um, making sure that, you know, all grant funded outreach activities need to be neutral, meaning you can't favor one broadband provider over another. Consumer choice is important. So, you know, if you are applying as an outreach um, partner and you receive an outreach grant um, under the TCOP program, you're going to be required to make sure that when you are conducting your uh, grant funded outreach activities and helping with the enrollment process, that you need to notify eligible households of different service providers that are operating in that area so that they can make a choice based on a plan that best meets their needs. If there's only one provider in that area, then it's fine to inform them of, of that sole provider. Next, it's um, some program prohibitions. One is supplanting or replacing outreach funding. We know digital equity and um, as, as a government-wide, whole of government focus, and we know there are different resources that are available out there to promote um, internet access and internet use. So what we don't want to see is, especially with the limited funding that we have under round two, we don't want entities to turn away funding from other sources to be able to um, pull from this funding source under the TCOP grant program. We want to maximize the dollars that, that are available. And the other one is accepting in-kind contributions from any broadband providers. Um, Again, right, we, we want to make sure that everyone is neutral and their um, grant funded activities and broadband providers don't have influence over um, our outreach partners that are conducting grant, grant funded outreach activities. Next, it's charging fees to eligible households. Um, this is an absolute no. Um, we've seen some grant applications as part of round one where they were gonna either charge fees to eligible households to attend events or profit um, from grant funded activities above the actual cost. This is definitely a no-no. We review all grant applications very, very closely and this will work against you um, in being selected for funding. So please just follow the program requirements very closely. The other is providing commission or compensation to individuals um, linked to ACP enrollment. So basically what this is, we know, um, you know, as outreach partners, if you're selected for a grant, you may recruit volunteers to help with outreach efforts, or you may um, have contractors or part-time um, resources that will help with outreach efforts. And and providing a stipend for, you know, as part of their salary is fine. But what we don't want to see is, you know, and, and we've seen this in the application again, and that is, you know, if if a personnel on, on the outreach um, effort is enrolling 100 households, for example, for an event, they get a bonus for a certain amount. So bonuses or commission. Um, linked and tied to how many applications are being completed or how many households are being enrolled is an absolute prohibition. Um, providing remote assistance, enrollment assistance um, is another uh, prohibition of the program. And one caveat that I want to provide here is we recognize that some organizations have call centers and they want to you know, reach out to eligible households and form them of this program, the Affordable Connectivity Program, and provide kind of a step-by-step -step guidance on how to complete the application for ACP. That is fine. Um, what we don't want to see is, and this is a program requirement, not just for this grant, but it's tied to um, the ACP rules as well. Any enrollment assistance that um, that is done remotely has to be just providing technical assistance. So like walking households through the process of how to enroll, but actually enrolling eligible households, that needs to be done in person. And the reason for that is with the ACP enrollment process, 
there is PII or personally identifiable information that is exchanged, that is entered into the system to verify that a household is eligible. Um, the household actually, you know, needs to assert and 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 be able to certify um, that what um, the information that they've put in there is truthful. So really, it's the as part of the submission process. So the household needs to be the the individual that is applying for the benefit needs to be the one actually submit entering that information and submitting that information. And lastly, the pro the prohibition is on lobbying as well. Next, I want to really highlight allowable and unallowable cost. And um, so I'll go over examples. And these are examples of types of allowable activities that we within the commission have deemed to be reasonable and necessary in carrying out um, ACP outreach and enrollment activities. We've also highlighted unallowable activities or unallowable cost. And these are things that are not considered to be necessary, right, for the purpose of increasing awareness and enrollment. And lastly, um, cost sharing or matching requirement. There is no requirement. It's optional. So if households want to, or if um, eligible entities, governmental, non-governmental entities applying for grants want to um, provide an optional cost share or cost match, they can. It's not required. Um, so we don't want that to serve as a barrier. Uh, one key highlight is, and, and I just want to really emphasize this, is, you know, if we see when we are reviewing detailed um, budget review of submitted grant applications, if we see that um, there are costs in there that are unallowable or unreasonable, we will we will reduce the request amount accordingly. And, and that will not be negotiable. And, and that will result in a further, you know, if your organization or your grant is selected for funding, that will result in delays in issuing the notice of award. So, um, you know, that is definitely something that we're going through at the moment with round one funding. There were some grants that we reduced their requested amount because there were some items that were un unallowable or they were not considered to be reasonable. Um, and because we made those reductions, we had to get updated forms and that resulted delays um, in getting the notices of award out, which will cause delays in being able to actually execute uh, grant funded activities. So adhere to the, the, the allowable and unallowable requirements, the funding caps, um, in there and um, the maximum amount that you're able to apply, and um, and that should that should assist. All right. So this is really, um, and if you're unable to see this, this is located in the notice of funding opportunity for TCOP round two. So you don't need to try to read the slide. It's in the NOFO, but one key highlight here um, that we've done a little differently from the first round of funding is so personnel fringe benefits supplies contractual so contract um, and other and part of that is management and administrative cost and indirect cost are all allowable categories so what we did was we aligned these allowable cost categories to types of activities that we permit um, as part of the outreach grant program. So application assistance slash enrollment events are allowed. So as part of that, we know there are planning costs associated with that, and that goes towards personnel. There are some travel costs associated with that. There are some supplies that need to be purchased and um, and, and spent, right? So we've captured part of that as well. Um, in some cases, we allow for light refreshments for in-person events, um, and that cost must be reasonable and directly related to the in-person outreach event. So what we did was develop a matrix of, okay, you know, digital campaigns is allowable, application assistance and enrollment events is allowable, um, outreach events, direct mail, 
program management. In some cases, you know, if you have to, if there's rental, a so facility rental associated with conducting um, an outreach event, you know, that is allowable. Paid media campaigns is allowable. So what we what we did was, uh, you know, break down, okay, if, if if your project includes ACP outreach events or direct mail, then that could be aligned to personnel, fringe benefits, contractual, or travel. So the way the application template is designed is you're, you'll be able to account for allowable cost categories against types of outreach activities that are allowed. So just refer to it. And if there are specific restrictions on certain types of expenses, um, again, that you'll see that bolded, oftentimes underlined. So that is basically screaming, pay attention to me. Um, so an example is supplies. IT related supplies is capped at $5,000 for the period of performance. So for the year, um, you can have other supplies and that's not capped, such as flyers, clipboards, notepads, but anything IT equipment related like laptops, phones, um, tablets, that is capped at $5,000 for the performance year. I won't go over these other items in detail. Um, another item that I just want to highlight is management and administrative cost, um, which is under the other category. This is capped at 5% of the direct cost. Um, and this, this is meant to cover basically your cost related to administering the grant program if you are selected for an award. So there are financial and reporting, financial and programmatic reporting requirements. If you are audited, there are specific things that you are required to do to as part of the audit process. And really, this cost is meant to support your obligations to, to be able to comply with program requirements. And that is capped at 5%. Next is a breakdown of unallowable cost. And um, again, these are things that are not considered reasonable for when it comes to um, you know, the purpose of the grant program. Most of these are self-explanatory, right? You, you're not gonna um, like construction or real property, membership fees, um, equipment, conducting exercises, those are not relevant to the grant program and the purpose of the program. So those are naturally not allowed. Uh, pay attention to under gifts and incentives, um, the note that is bolded and underlined. We are trying to draw close attention to this because we unfortunately have seen a lot of grant applications under round one that had this. And again, we made budget reductions as a result. Gift cards and giveaways of any sort are not allowable. And this is both to consumers and to outreach personnel. So giving outreach personnel gift cards, giving eligible households or consumers um, giveaways like tablets or phones or whatever it might be, that is not allowable. So if we see any indication of this in your application, we will we will flag it and make a reduction to your requested amount. Um, so just this this is not only gifts and incentives doesn't just apply to consumers, but it applies to um, outreach personnel as well. So I think it's a natural place to pause to. For some questions before we get into the application templates. Oh, great. I wanted to give you a break anyway, Miriam. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So there are a couple of questions, but I also want to point uh, the participants to the Q&A uh, function because the FCC.gov slash ACP dash grants website is posted there. <clears throat> and all information, <clears throat> excuse me, you can find about the grant program there, including who got grants in round one. And um, we're going to go to the first question is, uh, this might be on slide nine, I think. Miriam, it's an eligibility question. Can you describe the types of tribal non-governmental entities that are eligible to apply? 
If the applicant is not a tribal government, does it need to have the tribe provide permission for the applicant? So they're seeking more information on the tribal non-governmental entities. Thank you for that question. Um, so that is one where I think the response is not like at all. Um, some tribal um, governments may require, right, um, and may designate specific community anchor institutions like libraries, some may not. So what we ask for is um, an example of non-governmental tribal entity will be, for example, um, whether it's a library or um, a housing entity or a nonprofit um, or some kind of social service organization that is on tribal lands. So um, that is a key differentiator is it has to be on tribal lands and it has to be um, providing to be to qualify for eligibility, also the funds must be directed to um, outreach and enrollment support to eligible households on tribal lands. So, Miriam, do you think the consortia applies to this non-governmental entities? Could that yes. be a way of interpreting that? So, uh, yeah. a, a national or regional tribal nonprofit would be eligible. Okay. Yes. Yes. Again, this is a good time to pause and answer a couple questions. Uh, and if you have more questions, please post them in Q&A. Uh, the only other question we have so far is, can a middle mile provider apply if it does not sell broadband directly to consumers? So can a middle mile provider apply if it does not sell broadband directly to consumers? So this is one we're actually in the middle of reviewing a question that we got similarly under the other, um, the National Competitive Outreach Program. So where my recommendation is um, if if you feel, and, and as part of the application process, you have to certify that the ineligibility provision doesn't apply to you. So if you are a middle mile provider and you decide that you you believe you are eligible and you apply, um, there's probably going to be, before we can even review your application, you're going to have to provide um, additional information on, you know, more about your organization. So I would say for this particular um, individual or entity that's asking this question, please email and I will include, um, let me see if I could quickly do that. Email the ACP grants mailbox. Um, what I want to do is work with you before the submission deadline to, to request specific information to um, and have our uh, general counsel make a determination whether or not you are eligible. Because if, if you are deemed ineligible, we don't want you to go through the process of submitting a grant application since we recognize it takes time, it takes it costs money to to put together a federal grant application. So um, please just reach out to us and um, I'll work with you individually. And in the response, I'm gonna include our ACP grants website. Yeah, we can help enter that in Q&A. Uh, Miriam, if you can't do it, we'll get somebody else to submit it. Yep. Um, uh, I think the rest of the portion is walking through the grant application, but do you mind if I ask a couple other questions that we've heard? Uh, Absolutely. Yep. So one is um, very in-depth, detailed mm -hmm. accounting of what you can do and can't do. But in terms of on-the-ground materials, uh, are there already materials that have been developed for uh, awardees to use if if they receive a grant award. In other words, is there materials that they can download and and help get the word out? Are they creating it from scratch or are they using templates that we have? That's a good question. And um, so in the NOFO, there is, we do talk about the ACP outreach materials and resources that are available to everyone. And part of that is the outreach toolkit. So what we have committed to do as part of our current um, pool of grant recipients under round one funding opportunity is have this information exchange forum. Um, and, and part of that is making 
the outreach materials that we're creating within the commission um, as part of our promotion of ACP to the public. We'll make that available to you all so that you can repurpose that information, um, customize it or tailor it to, you know, for a specific outreach um, that you're conducting so that you're not reinventing the wheel or creating materials from scratch. And conversely, you know, as we get this information exchange form up and running with the current list of um, grant recipients that we have, anything that they create, especially materials that are in translated in languages that is not part of our existing outreach library, we want to collect that information from them and turn around and make it available to the broader outreach community. So short answer is yes, there will be materials that you can pull from. And um, so that, you know, we're, we're making um, our materials available to you. And as you start creating your own materials, you make it available to us so that um, the broader community can benefit from it. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, one other question that, and I want to get this on the table now, is uh, what are tribal lands? <clears throat> and then uh, the TCOP uh, category is really based on uh, signing up for the $75 discount on tribal lands. Mm -hmm. and, and so in terms of our outreach, we've heard a lot of questions about is the ACP benefit awarded to tribal members who are not on tribal lands, or does it apply to those who are currently living on tribal lands? So the question regarding who can take advantage of the $75 discount, um, I will take that as a get back question and, and really make sure that, um, and there are resources available on, um, on our ACP outreach um, website, not the grants, but just the ACP in general website that goes into who can benefit from it, um, from the different discount, and, and what does that actually look like? Um, so I don't want to misspeak on that front. But in terms of the definition of tribal lands, um, that is something that if you look at page 45 of the NOFO, it's the second to the last page in TCOP round two, it does define and actually provide a link to qualifying tribal lands. So um, I would just encourage everyone to to refer to that. And that is that is not, you know, I didn't come up with that. Um, it was established as part of the the rules that established the outreach grant program. So it is in the second report in order. Well, so I'm you. merely enforcing it. If you don't like the the definition of that or don't like the map, um, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Understood. I think uh, the only other item that I think might be helpful just to go over again on high level, I think it's slide 14 about providing remote assistance. Yep. Uh, I think it's helpful for us all to understand what that means because there are certain things it sounds like that you can do remotely, mm -hmm. you can't do everything remotely. Yep. Yes. Um, and that, even till this day, um, that seems to be a very confusing um, concept, right, for a lot of our grant recipients. And in the way the commission has um, interpreted this is when it's, you know, if think of your call centers where you can you can call consumers or consumers can call you and ask about you know, what is the ACP program? You know, how, what does the enrollment process look like? What are the different steps that are involved? What are the types of documentation that I need to have available to, to confirm my eligibility? Because ACP enrollment is a two-step process. First, households have to qualify for ACP, and then they have to take that information to their service provider to actually complete the enrollment process. So, um, Basically, that kind of walkthrough of what does the process involve, types of documents that are required, what to expect, um, that kind of support, that could be done remotely. Um, what has to be done in person is 
actually on behalf of the household completing the application. So completing the form saying, you know, first name this, last name this, um, social security number or date of birth this, or depending on the type of, um, you know, program that the eligible household is qualifying under, providing specific information. And at the end of the enrollment process, the individual that is um, applying for the benefit program has to submit, right? And has to basically confirm that what they provided, the information that they provided is truthful, is accurate, and they have to submit. That has to, that component of it, outreach partners can provide assistance, but that has to be done in person. And that is really, that requirement is to, is in place to help mitigate against what waste, fraud, and abuse. So um, really key takeaway is for call centers or even just for various remote assistance that's being provided. If you're just assisting a household, kind of generally walking them through, you know, what to expect and how to complete the form could be done remotely. But if it's actually completing the form on behalf of the household, um, the household, you know, the individual that's enrolling in that benefit needs to be present on site. Well, thank you. We had a new question about uh, post providing the link to the map of tribal lands. So we'll try and get that uh, posted in the Q&A uh, before the, the webinar ends. So those are all the questions we have right now. Thank you, Mary. Absolutely. So next, I'm going to just advance to the application submission requirements and um, just really kind of walk you through what are the different forms that are required and how to complete that. So to, to make an, a submission, a complete one, a complete submission, there are the standard forms that are absolutely required. And then there is the, the program narrative slash budget form, which is the TCOP application template that's in Excel. So the standard forms, this is again, required for all federal grants. So it's not unique to us here at the FCC, it's required for everyone. And that is the SF-424, the application for federal assistance, the SF-424A, which is the budget information for non-construction programs, the standard form um, lobbying activities and the disclosure of lobbying activities, if it applies to your organization and what we're um, in the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. So the NICRA or the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, again, this is one where if it applies to your organization. So if your organization has negotiated an indirect cost rate with the federal government and you want to use that for this grant program, we are going to need a copy of your current NICRA, um, the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. And we're gonna need that at the time of application submission for us to approve the amount that you're requesting as part of your indirect cost. If you don't have an indirect cost rate agreement with the federal government, the program does allow for up to 10%. Um, of indirect cost. So even with that, what we ask for is that you don't have um, a NICRA and you're opting to use a 10% de minimis rate. So just pay attention to the NOFO and the guidance on indirect cost rate agreement for further information. And then next is the TCOP application template. This is last round. Um, it, this template was in PDF and there were some lessons learned that um, as part of that process. And we made a decision to recreate that template, make some changes to it and make it Excel based. So the template is in Excel and we want it submitted in Excel. So please, 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 when you submit your TCOP application template, it has to be submitted to us in Excel. Otherwise, it will be impossible for us to be able to review um, the application because things will be cut off, sections will be missing, and it will put you at disadvantage because we're, we're not going to come back and ask for you to provide the Excel format. Um, if we can't review the information that we got because it was submitted incorrectly and things are cut off, then that's going to impact um, 
the merit review and the score that your application will, will get. All right, um, so all submitted applications will go through a three-step review process. First is just eligibility and compliance, and, and these three steps, it's pretty much, um, I apologize, I'm sorry, oh, okay. The second one needs to say merit review, so um, we'll make that fix before we send it out. But um, the first one is eligibility and compliance review, and, and that is, again, to make sure that everyone that submitted a grant application is actually eligible under the grant program. The second one is going to be merit review, um, and the merit review is to determine the quality of proposed projects against the objective um, and, and the proposed cost and what each applicant is proposing to do are consistent and supportive of one another using a predetermined scoring criteria. The scoring criteria is in the NOFO, so there are no surprises when it comes to how your application will be reviewed and scored and what weight each question carries. And then lastly, it's the detailed budget and risk review. And this is to make sure that at the end of the day, um, you know, all entities that are applying are in good standing with the federal government and have, um, they don't have, you know, negative findings from audit financial assistance or, or from federal audits of financial assistance. Um, they have, again, active same registration, they're not on the do not fund list, um, and so on and so forth. And the details of that is in the NOFO. And we also will conduct as part of this process, um, a very, very closer review of detailed budget worksheet. And that is to ensure that all the costs are allowable and they're reasonable. And anything that's unallowable and unreasonable will be deducted from the requested amount. Just quick highlight here, um, when it comes to the notice of award, you know, if your organization is selected for funding, what we will do is issue a public notice, and this is in the end of September timeframe, announcing who has been selected for funding and, you know, what is their final allocation amount. So oftentimes that may change from what the requested amount is, and if, and if that's the case, um, it's probably because we made reductions due to unallowable or unreasonable budget items. And then once the public notice is issued announcing who the awards are, we will then work um, on a rolling basis, notifying individual recipients and issuing the notices of award on a rolling basis. So that process takes time. There might be some additional information or documentation that we may need before we can actually issue the notice of award. And, um, and that will take place on a rolling basis through likely the end of November. So just wanna, and then once the notice of award is issued, recipients will have up to 30 calendar days to accept or reject. So it's not an automatic process. You know, once we announce who has been selected for funding, you won't get your notice of award the next day. The money won't be in your account the next day. This this process takes time, so um, I think I just want to kind of help set expectations on um, on this part. Post award requirements again. This is um, everyone who has been selected for an award will be required to submit financial report and progress report on a quarterly basis. And it's due 30 days after the closing of that reporting period. And, and that, you know, the schedule is in the NOFO. Um, PPRs and FFRs will be required at the same time. Progress report recipients will be providing an update on their progress for that respective quarter. Whereas for the FFR, the financial reporting will be, um, on a kind of cumulative basis to represent how much funds they've been, um, has been obligated or unobligated. And the PPR to include PPR supplement and the FFR, all of that will be handled through grant solution. So pretty much if you decide to apply, we go through the review process, you're selected for an award, all the interactions, 
from post-award through the course of the performance period will be handled through grant solutions. It's our grants management system, and this is ensure, to ensure that we have kind of a one-stop shop for all the interactions that we have here at the commission with the grantees. Monitoring and compliance, again, this is routine for federal grants. Um, there will be monitoring protocols. So um, and it'll vary from desk-based reviews to on-site reviews and what will trigger desk review versus an on-site monitoring. That is all spelled out in the NOFO. And, um, and really the on-site monitoring is typically designated for high-risk recipients or where um, where we end, we identify some concerns as part of our monitoring process where we need to schedule on-site visits. Um, internal audits and internal controls, this is again to help prepare uh, recipients in the event that um, they are audited by the GAO or OIG, and also um, the single audit requirement that's um, that's required for anyone that receives funding in excess of $750,000 from all federal funding sources for the fiscal year. Close out process, there are different mechanisms in place to close out awards. Some is, you know, it may be due to non-compliance. It may be um, due to failure to perform in accordance to the specific uh, conditions that have been established for a particular awardee, or it might be an administrative closeout. Um, so this is, again, there are post-award reporting requirements. They're in place for a reason. If, if they're not being adhered to, there are different mechanisms to um, close out awards. So we just wanna make sure you all have an understanding of what that is. Records retention, again, this is, um, you know, if you are selected for an award that after the closeout process, records must be retained for a period of three years um, from the date of um, submission of the final expenditure report to the FCC or the final FFR. And further guidance on records retention um, will be provided as well. So just a reminder of key dates and times. So the application window officially opened on May 25th when the notice of funding opportunity for TCOP round two was released or published. Applications will be due in exactly a month from today. And that will be on J July 28th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So please, you know, if you're going to go through the process of completing an application, putting together, you know, resources and submitting a grant application, we don't want you to be ineligible because you missed the deadline. Um, the deadline is the deadline. And unfortunately, there were some entities that missed the deadline last go around and we weren't able to accept their application because it's it's unfair to other recipients that um, that followed requirements and um, th the guidance that we provided in the NOFO. So just pay close attention to the deadline. Plan ahead. Don't wait until, you know, 5.59 p.m. to submit your grant application. Give yourself enough time. Make sure you go into the system a week before the deadline to make sure all, you know, the people that that will be submitting formally submitting the grant award have the right access. If they don't have the right access, that you have time to work with the grants.gov help desk to um, to make whatever adjustments so that you are able to submit um, successfully. And um, we're looking to issue awards in the end of September timeframe, and um, the period of performance is going to start in November. And then in terms of the application review, so for the SF424, and the slides here will be shared, this is just a screenshot. Basically anything that is in yellow is where entry is required. So go online and fill out the um, 
online version of the form because it's the fillable um, version and, um, and make sure that all the yellow fields are completed. Uh, for the 424A, if you are considering cost share, cost match, the non-federal um, section column of the 424A is where you include the cost share amount, um, equipment and construction here under object class categories, those are not allowable. So if we see any amount there under equipment and construction, we will zero that out because it's not allowed. And lastly, the object class amounts um, on the far right column needs to make sure that it aligns with the application, the, T, the TCOP application template. Again, all the yellow fields are where entry is required. Please make sure this is another thing that we saw routinely where amounts in the 424 didn't match the requested amount in the 424A, which didn't match the requested amount in the application template, which, which is confusing to us, as you can only imagine. And oftentimes what we would do is we would just look at the requested amount in the application template because that's where you provide a detailed budget breakdown. And if that is less than amounts in the 424 or 424A, then that's just a decision that we will make. So just as part of your final review, just make sure all the numbers add up. All right. Um, so in terms of how to retrieve application materials, so this is a screenshot of grants.gov. And when you are searching for this round two opportunity, this is the opportunity number. So make sure it ends in 004. Again, that's consistent if you recall from earlier in the presentation in the cover page of the notice of funding opportunity. That is where we list the opportunity number. And um, the TCOP application template can be retrieved from, from grants.gov. You can access it in Excel, submit it in Excel. Um, and all of these forms have to be submitted for, for, for your application to be considered for funding. Before I share the resources, just wanted to share what the actual application template looks like real quick. And I won't spend too much time, but so this is a template itself. There are three tabs. The first tab is instructions. And I would say read the instructions closely to be able to um, before you submit. And when you submit, we've included naming convention that we want you to use um, when you submit your form so that we can quickly identify who you are and what state or territory you um, your organization is located based out of. And um, some reminders as well. The second tab is the actual template itself. It is locked, so only the yellow fields are editable. Um, all the other fields are not. So if you click on other fields and you're like, well, won't let me change things, that's by design. Um, so please don't reach out to us saying the form is logged for editing. Only the yellow fields are where we want you to complete and submit. So um, if your organization has subrecipients, you select yes, and then it will enable um, information on what, you know, you providing information on who your subrecipients are in addition to their unique entity identifier. This is required, but the way the form is set up, you know, you provide information about yourself. We, you provide information about performance measures, like how many outreach events you plan on conducting, how many households you plan, you plan on reaching and how many individuals you plan on enrolling. Again, this is just to better understand the potential impact um, your project will have so that as you know, we progress through the performance period, we can actually see what progress you're making against your target. Um, again, anything yellow is editable. If there are certain sections where if you select 
yes, for example, it will enable other fields that you would have to complete. And if you select no, then you don't have to complete the gray sections. And the program requirements that I shared with you over the slide earlier, there are specific questions um, in the application template designed to allow you to provide a response. Um, so pay close attention to the character limits, their width spaces, and then um, budget or outcome and milestones. You can have up to four outcomes and up to six milestones. And we want you to not only share what your proposed outcomes are, but also when you plan, you know, when you plan on accomplishing them, when you will start, what, when you will end. And this information will be helpful for when, you know, if you are selected for an award for monitoring purposes and acknowledgement. Again, um, make sure you fill this out. And then from a budget standpoint, again, all the yellow fields are required if if it applies to your organization. So for example, if you have no travel associated with your proposal, then you can leave the travel section blank. But if there is travel associated with your grant proposal, then we want you to complete this and everything that's in gray is locked and will auto-populate based on information that you enter in the yellow fields. Some fields are drop down menu. So, you know, if, if it's a drop down menu, you're going to be forced to select from one of the pre um, determined list. For your subrecipients, we definitely want to know your subrecipient budget. So, that would go under the contractual category. So, you know, if, if you have subrecipients or contractors, this is where you would share information about who they are. Um, we know in some cases you may not have contractor information until post-award and that's fine. So you can just include information about what that vendor would be doing. Um, all subrecipients will need to be named at the time of submission. Their UEI will need to be provided. A brief description of what portion of the grant activity they're going to support will need to be included in addition to generally like how much of the amount that will be going to the subrecipient is going towards personnel, fringe, travel. So just key reminder here, anything in yellow is required if, it, if that budget category applies to your proposal, anything in gray will auto um, complete. And then at the very, very end of the form, and we've allowed for up to 10 contracts slash subrecipient information. So if you have like three subrecipients and four contractors, um, you'll be able to have enough space to provide that information. And then, um, so this is where at the very end of the form in the detailed budget worksheet, it will Auto calculate how much is for personnel, fringe, travel, equipment is NA, so should be zero. Supplies contractual, again, construction is not applicable, so should be zero. It will pre populate all of that. So, this is where when I say check your math and make sure everything lines up, use this as the source of truth to make sure that this information lines up with this in the 424A. So under section six object class categories, make sure that the far, the total column section, subsection five, um, the very last column for object class categories here is consistent with um, the budget summary section of the detailed budget worksheet. So with that, um, Thank you for sticking around for almost an hour and a half. Um, I know this was a lot of information. We'll share the recording. We're sh we'll share the slides. And I believe we may have a couple more questions. <laughs> Excuse me. But refer to our grants website. We have the notice of funding opportunity and a fact sheet there. Reach out to us. Um, 
acpgrants.fcc.gov um, or my colleagues in ONAP, and we'll make sure to assist you before the deadline. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, I don't see any new questions, but uh, Derek Goatson, who's on the ONAP team, actually uh, provided a link to the map for tribal lands. So I hope people can uh, click on that and, and bookmark that. I'm going to click. Uh, okay. So, um, sorry, I'm just taking care of these. Again, the links in Q&A uh, for the grants is really helpful. And uh, you have the email address for more information. We'll just give it a minute here to see if there are any additional questions. Uh, while people are thinking about that, I want to thank Miriam and your team. That was a, a great presentation, a lot of information, a lot of details. And then I want to thank the ONAP team, uh, Lloyd Collier and Derek Goatson, who uh, are behind the scenes making all this happen also. We got a question from the Spokane tribe. Is there training available to assist with completing the ACP application for consumers? So uh, let me take a, a stab at that. I think the Spokane tribe is wanting to provide the ACP program to your consumers. Could you please clarify that? Or Derek, I don't, since you're in the attendee mode, I don't know if you can come back into the panelist mode and help answer this question. And I may be able to answer it too, Bambi, if you don't mind. Um, so we actually last um, Wednesday or Thursday delivered a training to our outreach partners, our grant recipients on how to enroll eligible, how to enroll households, um, walking them through the ACP enrollment process step by step, walking them through the ACP um, program enhancements. So we will do the same thing um, for outreach partners that have been selected for funding under round two. And there are also resources that will be made available to grant recipients um, where, you know, where if they need like a train the trainer um, request, if they have that type of request, we can facilitate that and get that set up. So we're not going to just leave you out there, you know, <laughs> on your own to, to be able to deliver um, training and figure this out, we'll be there alongside you to help support you. You got a, a floating thumbs up on that. I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Let's see if there are any other questions. Well, while we have a minute, I'm gonna put in a plug that uh, ONAP is organizing a tribal workshop that will be hosted by the Lamy Nation uh, July 12th and 13th in Washington state. So it's two weeks from now. So I don't know if anyone's a bit able to join us, but uh, we'll cover a little bit more of the ACP uh, philosophical and background on it, as well as other topics. Well, I think that seems like the natural end to the webinar. I wanna thank everyone for joining and participating. Again, thanks to Miriam and your team and thanks to the ONAP team. So with that, I am going to uh, wait a few seconds before signing out. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Yep. And thank you for having me.